if you've an ounce of Scottish blood or Scotland in your distant heritage, then listen on. Today I'll continue to read a story from the Introducing Mr. B books. They were written to help children understand and enjoy Robert Burns' poems. This month's story is Working People. It was inspired by Robert Burns' poem Is There for Honest Poverty? Alan read the email twice. It was from his granddaughter Fiona and said, I need to speak to Grandad on internet video on Saturday morning about some Robert Burns poetry. Saturday morning meant his time in Canada, and it would be early evening for her in Perth, Scotland. When she clicked on the icon alongside her Grandad's name, the computer took a few seconds to connect. Then she saw his image on the screen and clicked again for a full screen display. Hi, Grandad. Fiona saw his well-worn book of Burns poetry on the desk beside his computer. Lots of yellow notes were sticking out of the sides of the book. Hi, Fiona, Alan said happily. He thought his nine-year-old granddaughter looked lovely, with her bright smile and blonde hair tied back in bunches. Now you have found the great poet, what can I do to help you? Alan asked. It's like this, Grandad. At school, the teacher told us to pick a poet and one of their famous poems. We were told to read it and explain the poem's message. I knew you liked Robert Burns' poetry, so I said I would do one of his. Grandad, I'm like really relying on you. Did you say what poem you were going to do? No, not without talking to you. What should we do? Hmm. If you're going to give me the choice, I would pick his poem, Is There for Honest Poverty. What's it about? It's about working people and has a special message that hopes for peace for the world. Hmm. Fiona tilted her head as she thought for a moment. Yeah. I think the class would like that. There are only five verses in the poem, so how about we take one verse at a time and explain its meaning? Burns cleverly wrote the poem explaining why we should value one another, and in the last verse he gives us a ray of hope for a peaceful future, Alan said. Sounds like a good plan, Grandad. Before we start, Let's clear up a couple of the poet's phrases. When Burns says, honest poverty, he's really talking about working people who make an honest living. That's simple enough, Fiona said. Then he says, coward slave, and today we would say people who don't get educated. Fiona hesitated for a second and then said, I think that's okay. And he links the line saying, and all that, and all that, which really means in spite of lots of things. <laughs> Most of my friends might say, whatever, Fiona smiled and said. <laughs> yes, that might work too, Alan agreed. Then the poet talked about our toils being obscure, which means it takes thousands of people to do most things, and any one person's work does not stand out. Does that mean people's jobs are not important? Fiona asked. No, just the opposite. They're all important. For example, how many people did it take to make your computer? Think of the miners digging the metals out of the ground, the crew of the ships that brought all the pieces from different parts of the world, people who built the computer, and the ones who make the games. Workers made the paper packaging. Then there was the store, employees, that sold it, and finally those people involved in recycling all the materials. You can see it takes thousands of different jobs to make most things, and they're all essential. I never thought of that, she said. Okay, 
Let's get started and look at the first verse, Alan said. It opens by telling us that working people had to keep their heads down and get on with the job so they could earn money to pay their bills. But it warned us to be smart enough to make sure we get educated. In a few short lines, the poet tells us to take pride in our work, even if we don't fully understand exactly how important our job actually is. Finally, he says the most important thing is not how much money you get paid, but the pride each person takes in doing their job well. I think that's a bit confusing, Grandad, Fiona said. Maybe it's not easy on its own, but if we read the second verse, it becomes clearer, he said. Here, in the second verse, the poet tells us not to worry about not being rich. Intelligent working people enjoy plain meals at home made with love, and they choose clothing that's not necessarily name brand. He suggests it's foolish to think you have to follow the advertisements that tell you to wear the latest fashions and clothes all the time. Regardless, if a person is not rich in money, as long as they're honest with themselves and others, they will be as good as anybody. That's a lot simpler, Grandad. Yes, it's easier now that we're getting his message. OK, we're at the third verse already. Here goes. To explain verse 3, I like to turn it upside down. It ends by saying, educated people today should enjoy a really good laugh when they hear people saying they are a lord. We should get an even bigger laugh when we see them parading in their ancient uniforms with a sash and star. It's hard to believe that some people still think these lords are special. Most of them got their title because they were rich, and not because they were intelligent. The poet really didn't like these lords, did he? No. And as you'll see in verse 4, he makes sure we get the point. This is what verse 4 says. Even today, the Queen still gives people knighthoods or titles like Marquis or Duke. But the poem suggests honest people are more powerful than the Queen. It says that, with confidence in themselves, people should see these titles as just empty names, no longer meaningful. Common sense and pride in the contribution a person makes will give them a more important role than any of those fancy ineffectual titles. Ineffectual titles? What does that mean, Grandad? It means that those titles are obsolete and do not have any relevance anymore. Here's the last verse and the message about peace. The poet says we have to hope that people all over the world will recognize the most important thing is for everyone to be well educated and have a chance to make a meaningful contribution. Then a time will come when all people, whatever their country, religion or colour of skin, will consider themselves part of one world family. That's it then, Fiona said. Yes, Alan said. When did he write this? Fiona asked. Just over two hundred years ago. Do you think things have changed much, Grandad? Fiona asked. Oh, yes. We're lucky to live in a time when we can see the world from outer space as a small blue planet in the universe. I can't believe that this doesn't change how we think of one another. There are no borderlines when we see this image. I agree with the poem. Peace will come, Alan said. I hope so, Grandad. Thanks for your help. I have to go now and print this up for the class. Bye, Fiona. Love you. Love you too, Grandad. Night.
At the back of the books, you'll find the Robert Burns poems that inspired the stories. Following on from the story, Working People, I'll read the interpretation and words of the poem, Is There for Honest Poverty? This is the lot of working people, that bows their head and all that. The uneducated person, we're better than him. We can live with not being rich regardless. For all the different things that happen, our work obscure and all that, the measure is not the how much you earn, the person themselves, the gold for all that. Even though on homely meals we dine, wear coarse grey clothes and all that, give fools their silk and rogues their wine. A man's a man, regardless of these things. For all those different things, their display of wealth and other things, the honest man, although ever so poor, is the best of men, regardless of these things. You see that fellow called the Lord, who struts and stares and all that, although hundreds of people listen in awe to him, he's but a dolt, regardless of what they say. For all his show and talk, if he's wearing a fancy ribbon with a star to show status, the man of independent mind, he looks and laughs at all the pomp. A prince can make a belted knight, a marquis, a duke, or whatever. But an honest man's above his might. Good faith, he must not follow those people, with all their false airs, their strutting ways, and whatever. Common sense and pride in yourself are worth more than all those people. Then let us pray that come some day, as come it will inevitably, that sense and self-worth over all the earth shall be the most important of all these things. It's coming yet for all, that man to man the world over shall brothers be for all. Is there for honest poverty that hangs his head and all that? The coward slave we pass him by, we dare be poor for all that, for all that and all that, our toils obscure and all that. The rank is but the guinea stamp, the man's the gowd for all that. What though on hamely fair we dine, we're hod and grey and all that. Ki fools their silks and knaves their wine, a man's a man for all that. For all that and all that, the tinsel show and all that, the honest man, though e'er so poor, is king of men for all that. Ye see yon burkey called a lord, wha struts and stares and all that. Though hundreds worship at his words, he's but a queef for all that. For all that and all that, his ribbon star and all that. The man o' independent mind, he looks and laughs at all that. A prince can mark a belt at night, a marquis, duke, and all that. But an honest man's a boon his might. Get faith, he may not for that, for all that and all that, their dignities and all that, the pith of sense and pride of worth are higher rank than all that. Then let us pray that come at me, as come it will for all that, that sense and worth o'er all the earth shall bear the gree, and all that. For all that and all that, it's coming yet for all that, that man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for all that.